Okay, I don't think I ever go to a conference where there isn't a technical hitch because I'm technically phobic uh, and I just want to acknowledge my wife Julia. Uh, I did a presentation about uh, two days ago and on the plane coming down last night I pushed a button on my laptop, completely removed it uh, and had to get up this morning and try and scavenge in my head as to what I was intending to tell you. So my apologies, it is a little bit over, all over the place. I tend not to write speeches because I find I get too constrained in what I'm about to say. Uh, the word, in terms of some of the things I'm just going to cover, I really wanted to talk about to you my perception in terms of what I've seen over, the, over recent years about how the consumer sees us uh, as producers, but more importantly, what that may mean for the future. Uh, and in doing so, I think it's important to understand, while well, science is important, and you are going to hear from speakers uh, following from me uh, that are much more professional and uh, understanding in terms of the requirements about what we do on our land, uh, it is uh, really important that we understand in a perception but also the demands and the values that consumers look for in terms of what they're doing. So on the basis of that, I wanted to just sort of reflect a little bit about how that impacts in their thinking. So look, I had the privilege uh, uh, from 2018 spending a couple of years based in London, uh, and out of my apartment on the fourth floor, this was the view. Now I live in uh, Balfour, and I look out my kitchen window at the Hokanui Hills, and when I looked at this, and I sort of thought, so which bit was I getting wrong? When it came to the environment, which bit was I getting wrong when I looked at all the chimney stacks uh, for 8 million people based in London? The good news is they're all full of concrete now. Uh, but for historical reasons, they keep them there uh, as a perspective of what happened in terms of the development of the city. Uh, and they don't smoke out stacks like they used to be. Uh, in, in terms of what they do. But it is often for farmers the, the problem that we have is to say, well, we seem to have all this pressure and we have this sort of negative aspect of saying all the things we're doing wrong, when in actual fact we should talk about the things that we've done to date to improve the way we operate and what we can do in the future. And that perception thing is always something a bit different. So what we perceive as being good and uh, worthwhile and, and value to the consumer is different for somebody else. So this is Japan. Uh, this is a dairy farm in Japan, uh, which was about 220 cows. Uh, those cows stood in these bales all of their life. The only time they went out of there was, which I'll show you in a moment, is when they calved. So they stand on padded mats and all the food is provided to them. So the alfalfa came from America. The cotton straw that they sat on came from China. Uh, the oats that they received and the minerals came from Australia. Uh, so none of the food consumed by the cows actually came from Japan. When I asked the dairy farmer what contribution he made, he said it was the air and the water. But because of food security and the perception of the Japanese uh, consumer, they see this as being quite important that the product came from where they live. And so this was the only area the cows went out onto in order to carve. And then they went back into the pad and carried on milking. Now from a perspective of a farmer who looks out onto green grass, we would say this is not a good practice. But the perception for a Japanese consumer is that it's OK. And if you look at each of the 120 countries around the world that we export to, they all have a different perspective about what is good or what is safe. If you go to the UK, the UK will spend much more as a consumer worrying about animal welfare than they will about the environment. If you go to Germany, they will think much more about the environment than they will about welfare. If you go to the Scandinavian countries, they believe that animals should be stored inside all winter 
it is cruel for them to be outside. Better hard to explain how Molesworth Station operates with 10,000 Herefords running around on the hills. So it is always, in my mind, a perception. And then the second thing that we run into is the belief about what we produce as farmers is what the consumers want to eat. And that has continually changed, and it will continue to change. So when I started as a kid, I hadn't heard of any of these things because my parents didn't give them to me. I have to admit to you, the first two are quite attractive for me, the others aren't quite so attractive. Uh, but the opportunity for a generation today is significantly different to what it was 30, 40 or 50 years ago. And the options and choices that we have on a day-to-day -day basis uh, is incredibly amazing. Tesco's ran out of tomatoes just a while ago. They come from Spain. They arrive the day before they are delivered into the, into the supermarkets. Alliance Group is an example. Lands chilled product at Southampton at three o'clock in the afternoon. It's processed at, by four o'clock the next day and in Sainsbury by 8 a.m. When they ran out of tomatoes, one day of 365, you would have thought the world had ended. In 2018, uh, soya milk ran out in New York and the coffee drinkers thought the world had come to an end. That is the level of expectation done by the consumer. And the interesting thing is that prior to World War II, the world worried about malnutrition. Post-war, we now worry about obesity. And that has been driven by two groups, the millennials and generation, excuse me, Z. God help us. I've got three of the first category. I find there is a difference. They are a bit like a vehicle. The pre-1990 models are much better than the post-1990 models. If you're not sure what that means, a millennial starts at 1981 and runs out at 1994. Why we choose those years, I do not know. I've got one pre-1990 and two after. And as you'll know, their expectations of the world are completely different and in terms of what they want and want to receive. They are driving the change. And we have to look at what they're driving in terms of that change because that has an impact on the future. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. I was fascinated by this. If you know of Prep Majeur, it is a coffee chain similar to Starbucks, slightly more, more high end. It has about 400 stores in London. Everybody goes there every day and gets their coffee on the way to work. When I first went there, I noticed that there were three options for dairy and then soya or, uh, our, <coughs> sorry, coconut, rice and oats uh, were the, the choices you could have. Within two years, these were the others. Tiger nut, pea, cashew, peanut, flax, hemp, walnut, hazelnut, pecan, sunflowers. And people would ask for each of these variations in their milk. So the cartons behind the barista were this range right along the shelf. You may not have heard of the last one, because this is where we're heading to now, spelt milk. So if you want to protect the environment, it's quite important that you don't buy these products at a supermarket, you make them yourself. So to make spelt milk, you take the grains, whatever you choose to use, you put them in water for, t distilled water please, not just Henry water, distilled water for 24 hours, strain it out, add into it either cinnamon or some other flavour like vanilla, and that is your milk for the next seven days. A very specialised process, but that's what's happening. In 2018, one in 10 coffees were chosen from one of those other products rather than a dairy one. 
And look, the reason for all of this is that we are now starting to understand how the gut reacts. And we are learning things like lacto intolerance is changing the way people use products. And that change will continue as we get to understand more and more. The interesting thing is that we always think by regulation we can change the way people perceive this thing. And as you could imagine, there has been a drive both in America and Europe to take the word milk out of all these other products by regulation. I always find this interesting because you hear this same argument from the meat industry about plant-based. And so the process is to say, well, you can't use milk. The manufacturers of these products immediately change the wording and so the most common thing you will see in Tesco in terms of the labelling of these products doesn't have milk, but has mulu or milk as it's spelt there. So the ability to believe that regulators are going to change the way the consumer consumes their product is a myth. The reality is the world will shift quite quickly in order to adapt to the way they're going. Some of you will have heard of an organisation called Kantar. They are the largest uh, company in the world that looks at consumer trends around the world. To give you an example, they average, on average, uh, survey between 100 and 150,000 consumers every day. In the UK, they do, on average, about 30,000. And these are the categories. I'd never even heard of these categories. These are how they look at the categories in terms of consumers. And it, you don't need to worry about what they are, but it is really interesting uh, in terms of what they look at. Alcohol is one of the biggest categories. So we do a lot of surveying around the world about what you do in terms of consumption of alcohol. But what Kantar have shown over the years is that the ability for people to make changes often comes from their perception of what they're doing. So let's have a look at vegans. Don't worry about the years, but to give you an example, this is around a five-year period. Google search by people wanting to know what a vegan is. And as you'll see, the line sits pretty static until about 2012, and then it started to climb quite significantly. In fact, I'm told it's climbed double that uh, in the last two years. And these are people who are seeking out to see what they want and what it means to be a vegan. I run into the odd one or two of these people every now and then. I have to say, if you're a vegan, don't need to tell me. Don't start preaching. I am not about to become a born-again Christian. I learn enough from my doctor every six months when I have to go to see him and have a medical check. I don't need you then to tell me what I eat. I'm a carnivore and I intend to stay that way. But they are having an influence again in terms of the debate that takes place around meat. So this started back in about 2010 and most of it was about processed product. And so every, most most producers of meat didn't need to worry about this. This was a European problem, mainly around sausage, and you were told not to eat bacon, ham, and etc. I often remind people we were told the same about peanuts and also in terms of consumption uh, that it was going to be bad for you, but ironically now nuts are really important uh, as a product in terms of the things that you eat. This has moved now into just all forms of meat product. And a recent survey by Kantar showed that 21% of households were consciously reducing the red meat consumption. This is a bit like a gym membership. When you survey a lot of people about whether they have a gym membership, they say yes. Do they actually go to the gym the level of times they were intending to? No. So there is a difference between what people perceive they're going to do and what they are actually doing. So the interesting thing is, and this is in the UK, 
there are still only 0.5% of the population of 65 million who are vegans. It hasn't dramatically increased. But the group that has, has been flexitarian. And so while even vegetarians have actually shifted to about 7%, this is 2018-17 figures, uh, flexitarians have gone from 7 to 14 per cent. Now the definition of a flexitarian has only been around for about 10 years. We all have them, most of them are our children. They are people who choose to eat a mainly plant-based diet but on two to three occasions a week will eat meat, fish or an alternative in terms of their consumption. This is increasing quite significantly. But on the basis of that increase, they are still see themselves as being a critical part in terms of the consumption of the product they eat on a daily basis. But if you were to look at the changes coming forward, these are nothing in comparison to what we would call disruptive technology. So the consumption for the food like this is dramatically changing in the way it's done. So to give you an example, in the UK today, 38% of the food consumed does not go through a household kitchen. 38% of the food consumed does not go through a household kitchen. It is either consumed by the service industry, through the restaurants, or take out food. I often tell the story that one of the funniest things I always saw sitting outside a pub at uh, Bridge Tower and the, we were sitting out in, on a summer's evening and the road was a four-way road at the corner of the pub, was absolutely jammed with vans delivering food to the households in the apartments nearby. You couldn't physically get a vehicle around. There were 12 vans parked in different parts while these fellas were carting food out either in the My Food Bag concept, or Gusto as it's known in the UK, or in pre-prepared meals. Every restaurant would have at least six scooters parked outside with Uber meals, etc., uh, delivering food to the households. A recent apartment block of 660 house, uh, apartments, one and two uh, bedroom ones built in Canary Wharf, only has a microwave for the kitchen. There are no other kitchen facilities within each of those apartments. Supermarkets are now having to make changes in terms of their footprint. To an example, Sainsbury have around 1,800 supermarkets and are looking at closing between 200 and 300 over the next five years. You go to a Tesco's that I went to near my apartment, there were no freezers. So all the food was fresh, and I couldn't even buy ice cream in a two-litre container. My wife was impressed, I was not. The reality is that if you wanted to get a frozen product, you had to go to a large supermarket uh, somewhere else in London in order to get non-frozen, uh, full frozen food. So these changes are happening quite significantly. And the ability to directly connect with the consumer will increase as we go over the next five to ten years. You will see also the changes in the way the supply chain operates for New Zealand in order to send those products will be significant in comparison to what we've seen to date. So for the future, these three things at the start are the ones that you are all involved in in terms of what is being seen and changes that are going to happen in New Zealand. I have to say that on the first two, the reaction in what we would call first world countries like the European, the US and the UK is quite significant. Their interest in terms of what New Zealand is doing in these two major areas is, has an impact. And so while we don't like sometimes some of the regulatory responses to these, 
I think the work done by farmers in New Zealand is exemplary in comparison to what I've seen elsewhere around the world. A lot of countries put in regulations, but their ability to actually deliver in terms of what land use is taking place in Europe, UK and the US is substantially behind where we are. I do think on biodiversity that the public policy aspect has still some way to go, and it is pleasing to see this week the Minister pulling back. Can I also say on animal welfare, in terms of the free trade agreements, this has been the one area that uh, the UK and the European 27 have badgered quite significantly in terms of New Zealand's negotiations. And it is one that we have to be constantly aware of because of the earlier examples I gave where they see uh, things like storing animals indoors over the winter is still something that is having an impact in the way they perceive us going forward. But similar to the argument we had about food miles, we've got another one building in terms of climate change. But often the perception, again by the consumer, is majorly influenced by their perception of what we do, the distance we travel, versus the reality of the impact. This is the second largest ship in the world, at Southampton, 23,000 containers. To put it in context, most ships that come to New Zealand can only do about 12,000 containers. The next biggest ship does 26,000 containers. It takes 660 metres to walk from one end to the other. Uh, in terms of its size. When you send a lamb in the container on this ship, its footprint is 6% of its total consumption. Right, 6% of the impact. For the consumer to travel in the UK from their home to the supermarket is 12%. So the argument that transporting product from one end of the world to the other is absolute nonsense. It is actually the impact that they do domestically that is far greater than what happens in terms of what they're going to do. Similarly, the argument about uh, the way we produce our product uh, has, without any doubt, uh, got a difference in terms of the opinions of the way people operate. If you look in the UK, the ability in both genetics and the way they operate their farming uh, businesses is still substantially behind what we do here in New Zealand. Uh, I, this is the Welsh show. I just got fascinated by the way they pamper their sheep in terms of what they do. But the changes that they are seeing both in the UK and Europe are no different than what we are here. This is a typical landscape of Wales. And as you'll see in the background, there are trees, they are going through a process, it's, I think this is a nonsense, uh, of seeing vast areas being planted in, in production of trees, but increasingly, to balance against that, they do this. And that is the belief that the more you can do in wind generation and sun generation uh, will help the way the climate operates in the future. So they're coming under similar pressures to us. But they don't always believe your story. Uh, this is a rental car I used one day. One of the farmers that I had uh, a lot to do with was a guy, a Welshman called Wynne Evans. And every time I spoke somewhere in Wales, he would batter the hell out of me uh, in terms of what New Zealand was doing. We didn't need our product, etc. Went In the end, I went to see Wynne one day and we had morning tea and when I came out uh, I forgot to put the car in park and it uh, rolled down the hill and into his um, effluent pile. Which I found quite interesting because it was just a pile of about seven or eight tonne dumped in the yard. And when we walked out and we pulled, he kindly pulled with his tractor the vehicle back out again I have to say, I drove for four hours to London every time I turned on the air conditioning, all I could smell uh, was the effluent. But um, the thing that really amused me was that was just pouring down the driveway, down into the grass and into the local stream. I never saw a fence against any river. 
I saw signs on bridges that told me that I couldn't swim in the rivers. 85% of the rivers in the UK are not swimmable. So the belief that we are in a situation that's far worse than other countries around the world is something that I find really difficult. When I talk to consumer groups, I always left this slide up because if we carry on on the argument that some would argue, uh, there wouldn't be many of us left in order to uh, feed the rest of the world. Thank you very much.